Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Um, so it's good to be back with you guys here today. And um, so as we get started, <clears throat> my bio, um, blah. Um, what I would like to say is that um, uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. And Scott, if you can kind of moderate and you want to pause for any reason, go ahead on that. Um, and to add the, uh, if I can get the chat up here too. There we go. I have the chat window up. Um, okay. So if we got any chats we want to get along the way, um, let's do that. <clears throat> um, and also at the end, we can do our best to answer any questions there. And um, you know, the the comprehension versus retention. Um, so I've got a lot of senior designers on here. So always intimidating when you're speaking in front of people that. Um, I hold you guys in the highest regard. I know you guys are solving some of the the most intricate. Um, uh, the highest regard I'm referring to is is, is I get it that I've got a, a mixed audience here, and uh, it's always intimidating when you do a preparation before other designers. Um, so if I'm saying something you already know, um, call it confirmation to what you know. Keep your eyes and ears open. You might pick up something or see a different facet to something you already know, which again would reaffirm what you know. Uh, but there's always something new you can learn. Um, and this slide here, I call it the ugly slide. Steph Chavez calls it the designer's triangle. Again, it's the first, it's a definition of our profession, and it's truly going to be in the entire 2200 series IPC standards. Um, that's where I was moments ago with, uh, uh, John Perry, Gary, um, working on the 2222 standard. But again, with the new release, this will be in the first paragraph of it. It's been adapted. And mostly, I believe you guys, this is part of your DNA. You do this already. You're talking to a manufacturing person. They're not thinking about the, the, uh, signal integrity. You're talking to a signal integrity. They're not thinking about either the solvability or the manufacturability. You know, sometimes a different CAD person is just trying to solve it and they're not considering the signal integrity or the manufacturability. Point is, you must look at all three. And that's the intent of this slide. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you see the word fast up there, that's my way of just saying I'm going to cruise through this slide. I've got a handful of them that you'll get copies of this. Probably stuff you already know. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, this one in particular is when you're starting a design, as we're going to talk about material here, you should never assume that when you get a material selection that it's an assumed uh, or, or it's an informed decision. It just may or may not be. Okay. It's always worth qualifying the decision. Um, cause it can radically improve the circuit's performance and the product's reliability and producibility. Um, you have no idea, um, how and why the decision was made and or who made it. So I put to you, uh, eight people right here that could have made this decision. Okay. And obviously if it was, for example, a purchaser or someone, you know, who really has no clue of why the decision was made, um, it could be a, a ill-informed one that could affect it. Um, here's some of the reasons, and um, <clears throat> some of them are good, and some of them are probably not good. You know, sometimes it was, well, it was the last thing that was written on the print from the previous board. Um, that previous board was, you know, uh, 10 years ago, and the clock speed was 100 megahertz. Uh, it's now a 10 gig board. So you get the, the picture with that. So fast slide. Um, we're going to cover just some of these factors right here on the next few slides so therefore it's fast so i'm not going to repeat it um when you consider materials and first i'm going to start off with um, the regular uh, fr4 type uh, epoxy based laminates um, know that they come in two forms a, a b stage the prepreg and the core which is a c stage um, both typically are comprised of the same mixture of both resin, resin and a fiberglass uh, both the prepreg and the core. They come in a variety of thicknesses, weave types, and the cores come with the metal on it. So there's different types of metal, so I'll get into that. Uh, cores are fully cured. The prepregs are semi-cured. They're flexible. Um, <clears throat> I have a nice picture that they're built in an alternating style, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that a little later on here. Um, but essentially, we're going to alternate between the two, a, a core. Um, where I try to balance the amount of etch on it, and then I put prepregs between two cores. 
And then the outer layers typically are a foil layer added on top of that for the subtractive method. And then it could be an additive method where they just do uh, electrode deposition. But the physical parameters we're talking about here, the T sub G, it's where the resin turns into a, uh, from a semi-solid state into a rubbery viscous state. Um, it's an, it, this is an important factor with high layer count boards. Okay. Um, you know, normally it was a, you know, back in the day it was a 140 and then it went up to the 170 or 190. Uh, when you truly start doing multi-layer boards, um, why it's important to have a higher T sub G is it just basically waits, um, till the whole thing starts moving and that affects the reliability and the stress on vias with many, uh, annular rings on it. The T sub D, a decomposition temperature, it's where the material breaks down from excess heat. Um, essentially, if you have a board and you're doing like, say, maybe a four lamination um, type of construction, that's four thermal cycles just in the fabrication alone. And then you're going to take it into uh, an assembly where you could go two or three thermal excursions. And then you could send it into usage and or environmental thermal excursions. Um, which will uh, basically it, it turns the material into a dust. You cook the resin to a dry, dusty state, so not good. Um, okay. <clears throat> so the material has a CT, a coefficient of thermal expansion. This occurs in the X Y axis and the Z axis. Okay. Um, the Z axis is resin, and the weave is the XY axis. So they each affect a different thing. The Z axis um, threatens the reliability of plated holes, okay, right in this area right here, as opposed to the weave is a uh, affects the warpage and threatens solder joints, okay? They both move in what's called a parts per million over the temperature, and the it's worse in the Z axis because the board is primarily thin in the Z axis as compared to the X, Y axis where it's, it's much longer. Okay. It's, you know, 62 mils by 16 inches. So it's a serious magnitude, um, difference between the two. Um, but the most dangerous is the Z axis because that's where your, um, via failures happen. And that's the majority of failures on a board or in a via plating of a via, um, from plating, uh, cracks to, you know, barrel cracks to, you know, crown cracks, um, where the pads joint, the butt joints on there. So there's many different plates. Um, IPC has a nice animation of what that looks like, all the places it could violate. And they're actually dangerous because they're intermittent failures where in a cold condition, they make contact and may test okay. But when you expose the board to either an environmental uh, heat or operational heat, then it becomes an intermittent failure. So it's a reliability you don't want. So that's why this um, Z-axis um, CTE is important. Fast one here, I'm not even going to hit it, but these are a lot of the different factors that, that occur, um, or should I say are parameters that affect some of the mechanical and physical um, things as far as moisture absorption, uh, the peel strength of the copper, um, calf, or stuff like that. Uh, some of the industry compliances. The electrical parameters that we're typically looking at is the dielectric constant and the dielectric losses, um, or dielectric loss. So the dielectric constant, E sub R or DK, it's also called a permittivity or a relative permittivity. Okay. How well, um, will electrical, uh, energy fields pass through something. The example is air is a dielectric constant of one. That's the lowest we know. That's the base point. And so most of our materials, the FR4s are called FR4 because it has a dielectric constant of approximately four. That's arrived because the resin is approximately three and the weave is approximately five. Okay, so this is your standard stuff. So the resultant is that. And most of this, the dielectric constant, people really make a big deal of this. Um, and you, sh you can get it down to the threes. Um, I know Isola has, you know, Tachyon or Astro, which are three. And Rogers is about two high twos, but almost three. Those are minute differences. So I put to you that get over your better materials, but 
you can adjust the trace width to compensate for this pretty easily. This one right here is where your RF people will really focus on this because <clears throat> energy is never really lost. It just kind of goes someplace. Um, so it, it dissipates into the material or the material can absorb it. And so DF, um, that's a property that in the material, it can absorb some of the energy. And so RF engineers are always much more concerned about DF. And I'll put to you the, that, however, when you talk about the differences between even a, uh, a any kind of uh, your ceramic type or Roger type materials versus the very low DF um, epoxy materials, 0. 0.0001 is such a small number, as opposed to the copper tooth profile, which can be 0. 0.1. So you can see that copper tooth profile is much more significant. If you're really trying to fight for low DF, the copper tooth profile is way more, um, you get more bang for your buck by pursuing this right here. There's even some chemistry process that can improve this. So um, I'll leave you to that. This is a weave. This is some blow-ups of the weave. The standard 1080 looks like that. <clears throat> you can see that if I had a differential trace, one going over the weave, might see a five, whereas this one going partially over weave and resin might see something in the neighborhood of a, of a four. So essentially on a differential pair, you could get um, some skew between that. People have tried this right here, and it's kind of silly to do. I've actually done it for a, a couple of uh, you know, large motherboards. Um, but that uh, basically, you try to mitigate the crossing of the gap, okay? People always come up, you always get somebody in the crowd that goes, well, why don't you rotate the material 45 degrees? Every fabricator in the group just kind of looks at them like, we'll let the clown in. You know, it's uh, not a good idea to rotate the material. It costs too much. So these are some blow-ups. The difference, you can see how a trace going over that would uh, affect. And then here are some, uh, some of the Isola spread weave product families. Most all of these here come in some sort of spread weave. So it is something you truly should be looking at. If you're doing anything over the 2.4 gigahertz data transfer uh, type of rates, be considering this. You know, is the material we're looking at, does it come in a spread weave type of material? And we talked about copper foils. Okay, so copper, essentially there's a few different types here. Um, you know, essentially there's a, an electrode deposited, a lot of times used in the additives. And then there's the wrought copper, which is the rolled annealed. Um, you can see this on, you know, on flex or, or the foil used on a, a uh, subtractive type thing. This is very common. And then the electroplated, this is used for holes, adding it into the holes. Okay, so these are the basic types of copper. And copper has very uh, low resistivity, so it's a good metal to use. It's an abundant supply. Um, so... Um, these are the different acronyms that are used. Um, they're not IPC designators, but just know that there's a lot of different profiles that exist. And I think it's the VLP2 um, is probably the lowest right here. And again, these can add sometimes in the magnitude of almost 0.2, um, they can reduce 0.2 dB loss per inch. So this is a very significant adder. Now, the problem with this, as you'll see in these next slides here, is um, that, yes, that's the same magnification that between these three. The rougher gives you a better adhesion, okay, um, versus the smoother, which has gives you lower loss. So those are the advantages there. Um, however, they are, they are in uh, opposition to one another, okay? Um, it's a battle between the lower loss and the peel strength. Okay, the rougher it is, the better um, adhesion it will hold to, and the peel strength is threatened. The peel strength is when you try to solder something or just um, any kind of stress, it, it will pull the pad off the surface. Okay, um, and yes, there's a cost driver to it, but again, that's one of the things we talked about last week. Always qualify what the production count will be when you're designing a board. Truly, really one of the most important things you do is deal with the production cost. Um, if it's a low production run, then the cost is not as much of a driver as this. My neighbor's starting up his motorcycle. There we go. <clears throat> now, 
So this is a, uh, a cross section here on the left. You can see the roughness. And um, here you see basically the smoothness here. This is a cartoon characterization showing it. These are actually some uh, magnitude pictures here. Um, I think you get the picture. And the issue is, is typically because the lower the frequency, the more the, um, the current will essentially penetrate into the, to the metal itself. The higher the frequency, the more the current is traveling just on the surface, okay? So the uh, skin depth, the skin effect, okay? So that's why the higher frequency, um, you can see that it's really truly riding the edge, and therefore you're increasing the delay in here. So um, just be aware of it. You can truly improve a, an RF design. You're typically, you know, it's what they call a non-lossy line. You're going to make it wider. And you're typically going to increase its uh, dielectric uh, thickness down to a, a ground return. And if you can add a lower profile metal to it, you've improved it. <clears throat> okay, so again, back to uh, some of the electrical, understanding the EMI. Okay, so frequency and wavelength um, are used for calculations, okay, um, for dielectric constant loss tangents. It's a measured cycle known as a frequency. Um, it, it forms the switching binary language. Um, there are many frequencies a lot of times in here, but they're squared off typically in a digital sign signature. And um, most people, when you ask them, um, how, what is high speed? They tell you a frequency and they don't really get it, that that's not the important thing about how fast the circuit is. Uh, frequency is how quickly uh, a signal will actually switch right here, okay, is what is the cycle time. And if I say a, a mega, it's a million times per second. A, a gig is a, bi a billion. So it's a billion switches. Um, the difference between analog and digital, think of it as a light switch. An on and off toggle switch is binary, okay, versus a dimmer switch, which might be more analog. Um, okay. Um, but the important thing to understand is that um, the important feature is this rise time right here, okay? Um, that that's where the energy, all the energy switches right in here. And sometimes if it overshoots or undershoots and then causes a ringing afterwards, that basically can cause a false trigger. So that's a signal integrity problem based on you lost contact with your ground return. And I say ground return because anything can act as a return, but ground is the best return because all signals switch relative to zero, okay? Zero volt, which we refer to as ground, okay? Um, anything can be an impedance backdrop, but return energy wants to go to ground. And so um, that's why I show it right here. But that's the important thing of determining where your P sub R, okay, your rise time or... Um, that that's or the slew rate okay that's what you want to look at it truly creates a distance okay one nanosecond equals about six inches if you exceed six inches you'll probably have um a delay okay so cut that in half if you look up and it's got you know 0.5 nanoseconds or 500 picoseconds you got three inches okay so that's a good rule of thumb to understand when you're looking at the rise time of your this ic typically you'll find it in the application note <clears throat> These are repeated rise times over here, repeated cycles showing up as an eye diagram. Why the materials matter is essentially, um, I ask people, where does the energy exist? And most people will tell me, oh, in the copper, I'm routing the copper energy. And the, that's incorrect, okay? So watch the way this slide unfolds. They think of it as single-ended energy going from a, a driver to a load and these symbols just show that there's a certain resistivity or inductance in copper. And they think that it's a return path going along here. And or differential is a forward and a backwards line. And that's usually how people conceptualize this. And it's incorrect because truly the energy field is as this, um, this pink color here, whatever color it is, shows that the energy field is immediate, okay, below it. Okay, and then a differential pair, it's here and relative to the ground. And it looks on a cross section something like this over here, that essentially um, it's an EM field, electromagnetic field, and exists in the material. That's why the material is so important. So the electrical, which is capacitive in nature, versus the magnetic, which is inductive in nature. 
Okay. And you see this here, it's called the right hand rule of thumb. So if it's going this direction, you then can tell which way the energy is going, whether or not it's from the load to uh, the source to the load. Okay. Differentials look like this. Essentially, it's two 90 ohm traces with about a 10% differential impedance between them. Okay. <clears throat> so the energy field exists between the trace and the plane, okay, within the dielectric material. You don't want to be the guy that ends, lives underneath the power um, wires, okay. I actually can shock my cat here. I live in San Diego. It's arid climate. Do it at nighttime. They just it put the fear of God in a little cat. Um, he won't mess with you no more. Um, but uh, you can actually see sparks flying at times by scuffing your feet, the static electricity going through a dielectric constant of one through the air. Okay, the energy exists in between two dissimilar nodes. In our case, it's a trace and a zero return path. So all signals are driven at voltage relative to zero ground. Do not confuse having a power plane someplace, which is an impedance backdrop. However, the signal is not drawn to it. It might be a different voltage. If it's a different voltage, it'll cause a switching. So ground is the best return path. Okay, anything will act as a return path. It just may not be a good one. Um, you guys get this one. I can kind of cover it pretty quickly. Surface microstrip, buried microstrip, strip line, dual strip line. And again, I think I covered this last week. I, I really hate this one because most people will add um, three and four traces in this picture. And then you really have a signal integrity nightmare, bad impedance and everything else. So. When you're considering a stack up, there's so many things you're considering. Think of the triangle. You've got to solve your board, so therefore you've got a lot of dense routing to do. You should have a ground plane every place, okay? And you need to bring your power in here. You need to balance the metal. But if you do this as a standard practice, sketch a resistor symbol, okay? And every time you're doing a trace to a ground plane, if you can give me at least one You've satisfied the ground return path issue. Okay, if the other one's a voltage plane, that's okay. If this one is a ground plane, as I'm showing here um, on layer eight between seven and nine. If I put two voltage planes there, not good. Okay, and the same thing is true when you're talking about a power plane. Is it adjacent to a ground plane? Now, right here in the center of the board. If these are far apart, you have very little effective capacitance between them. Truly, I'm going to pick a number. The smallest you typically want to go is three mils. You don't want to go less than that unless you're using an exotic material, uh, an embedded capacitance material. But if you go much more than, let's say, uh, eight to 10 mils apart, you have very little effective capacitance, okay? And you certainly don't want to put a signal between the two because now the power and ground have a resident harmonics. You put a signal right in between the two. And so it will, um, it will be cross-talked but between the voltage and the signal. So just don't do that. So I suggest always having a ground plane by every signal. And then I like backfilling the power plane um, with my voltages and putting them closer to the surface. So again, this is the two most important um, bullets right here. Get these last two bullets right. And you've truly solved a significant amount of your signal integrity and power integrity concerns. Is just give it an uninterrupted ground path. Don't lose, don't go over a split. I think we passed that slide earlier. I'm going to back up a couple here. That was this slide right here. Don't cross a split plane because then your return energy goes down here making noise as opposed to send it over this way. I don't like splits, period, because the magnetic field can escape through here. And so you, that, that will occur. That keeps pushing until it finds an opening, and that becomes a slot-type antenna portal. So just route it around the split like that. So let's go back to 22. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so back to the materials. When you're considering different materials, and yes, I, I, I work for Inselectro, and so I'm telling you about Isola products. There's a lot of materials that are out there. I, I've used probably the majority of them. And some of your customers are just going to come along and they're going to say, no, we definitely want this. And fine, you, you do that. Um, I get to tell you about Isola uh, because I work for them. So 
by way of just using this slide, you can see that different material come for different purposes, whether it's a thermal reliability or a high speed and high reliability type of material, whether it's an RF or a microwave, okay, or a <clears throat> low flow prepregs, there's different ones that are that, and then some specialty ones. Um, the newer ones is this thermal one over here. So if you've got like an electrical vehicle, you really want to look at this. The T sub G is a 200, which is one of the highest out there. Um, good for like downhole drilling or anything. <clears throat> and then um, the Terra Green is really kind of a, you know, it's not the highest end of the high speed digital, um, but there's a really uh, good solution. It's kind of middle grade, but it actually handles pretty well. Tachyon is the higher end of that. Um, it's truly geared to go up to the 100G, and they're actually announced what's going to be like a 400G type of uh, product that's coming out, so keep an eyeball out for that. Um, in the RF section right here, uh, again, the Terra Green. So again, what you're looking for is these DFs. Remember, 0039. Um, the Astro, check this one out here, 00, what is it, 0017. I think the best Rogers is 0009. Um, so it's very little difference. And when considering metal, it's not the driving factor. Metal is more important. But what's interesting about these is these two, Astra and Tachyon, um, my daughter had just done a, uh, a 5G phased array beam forming uh, uh, antenna board, which, you know, half digital, half uh, RF. These two were used in combination on the RF side and the digital side. They have identical resin systems, so it makes them a similar construction, okay? This has a very thin weave, and this one has a normal one, both available in a spread weave, but a great solution for a mixture of high-speed RF and digital. And as opposed to if you're using this and then you use a ceramic, the problem with using that ceramic is that it's dissimilar. It has a, a thermal threshold of 500 degrees. So if you send a via through all of it, essentially that via is going to be subject to two different um, CTE mismatch, the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion we talked about earlier, and it stresses the reliability of a via. So it may work great. and You may pass initial tests, but in the field, you've decreased its reliability. All right, that's the next slide. Um, so again, this is their product ladder. Again, the reason I'm up here is I put it up here so you can look and understand how these different properties play out and understand how they work. Okay. And because we also rep the, uh, the DuPont, I'm showing these here. I'm not going to spend time playing sales guy with this, uh, but just know that they have different applications and there's basically um, a couple types of material and that exist out there. Um, or type of, a couple types of constructions, I might say. Um, you know, I'm looking at one thing here. I'll cover that later. Um, so this is a fast slide. There's just different types of flex. You guys have probably seen that. Um, you know, the the rigid flex. You know, essentially it's 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 part you know bare board and part flex. And this is the uh, the book binder type right here. Um, there's two types of basic flex too. There's the kind with adhesive and then there's adhesive less. All those Pyrolex ones I showed you earlier for the most part are geared more towards the adhesive less type of material where it's just the polyamide base and then with copper as opposed to having an adhesive in here. So if you're doing a cheap, a cheap type one, you know, the standard uh, uh, board can use this adhesive, but the, point of this slide here was to show you that there's a handful of different ones. This one's high reliability. That's what's on the Mars Rover. Um, the high temperature ones or the um, some of the high speed ones. Okay. So if you're truly doing that, just know that there are some um, higher end materials that are out there. All right, let's move on. This slide right here, essentially <clears throat> when you're trying to send a high speed signal between a rigid board over a flex to another rigid board, how do we protect that, maintain its impedance, and stop emissions? And so essentially, normally you'd want to put a trace across there, and the other side might be a ground return path. So the idea of using a 45-degree um, weave, or excuse me, a crosshatch, 
minimizes if you had a trace coming across here. So my recommendation is also on that same ground plane layer, add what I call a shadow trace, okay, whereby you can then route a trace over the top of it. And so I've solved my immediate return path, uninterrupted ground plane, but I don't have a full ground plane all over the whole layer, which would um, be more subject to breaking and hard to bend. Okay, so let's jump in a little bit of uh, into some what's known as HDI. When you say HDI, it can cover a lot of things. I mean, micro traces are an HDI, but most people immediately in their mind, they go to laser vias. Well, a micro via is actually by definition in the 2221, and essentially it's the aspect ratio of a one to one or better. Okay, for example, like a 0.8 to one um, with like a four mil dielectric to a five mil drill. You don't want to go much lower than that five or six mil drill with an HDI. Um, they just start, reliability starts going up, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about reliability when we talk about these things. But just know that this is a specific definition um, that exists. <clears throat> you understand through holes, buried vias, blind vias, you know, visible from one side. You get, you, I think you guys get all this. There's a handful of ways to make the holes. This shows a bunch of them here, you know, from mechanically drilled to laser drilled to wet etch to punched or stuff like that um, and or paste filled. Um, I like this picture over here because it shows that the plating is in a concave type of pattern, meaning it's thicker on the top than it is in the middle. And um, how the hole is metalized can be like a uh, electro um, plated here where they put it in a plating bath and it slowly migrates through this hole to plate it. And um, <clears throat> I usually ask people, I said, how thick should the, the plating wall be? And I get a whole bunch of people use the answer and they go, oh, I know that question. They go, one mil. I go, well, one mil is actually a very robust number, but it's an incorrect answer. The answer should be, it depends what class the board is. If it's a class one, two, or three in the, uh, in the 2221 IPC spec, it has a definitive minimum plating wall thickness. Okay, so I don't expect you to know that number, but I expect you to know how to use control F and search for class three in the 2221. And, um, okay, let's see. Um, someone else was calling. I'm just going to ignore that. Uh, okay. This one right here, uh, this slide here is talking about the difference between, um, some of the benefits of HDI. So you've heard of uh, staggered vias, stacked vias, or stacked um, on a buried. Okay, so we think of all these images in our head. And um, so because of product miniaturization and the pitch and the features are getting smaller, we have to do this, okay? Yes, it's more expensive as a general rule, um, but you get layer reduction and you, you're um, cost for connection might improve, okay? The parasitics are less, okay? I don't have a stub, okay? Um, so we you improve your noise margins. It's reliable. It can be reliable because of the better aspect ratio. It's a, you know, it's a thinner uh, dielectric and um, an improved via metalization. But this has been challenged with the practice of stacking more than two vias. This is important. Um, as a designer, we like stack better. It's easier and it's, it's easier for us to manage from a solvability standpoint. But when you stack more than two, you decrease your reliability by a tenfold factor. Sit through a Jerry Partita presentation. He's got them out there. He's done them. He did it at the, uh, Scott McCurdy's, uh, uh, PCEA, uh, council chapter meeting and made a very clear case that, um, the, Microvia reliability when you go more stacking more than two is uh, significantly challenged. Okay, ICT is challenged also due to the access of nets. Okay, um, same thing with testing of bare boards. Okay, and the concept of seeing multiple thermal exc uh, excursions. I already talked about that. So you want to research all these requirements at the start of your board. So I show this quickly here to just show you that. That HDI consists of you can have VN pad. That's a form of HDI. Rather than having it dog bone out, is maybe just slide it right into the pad. Okay, so you can see the images here, whether it's offset. When you get below 
or you get to 0.65 millimeter pitch, you have to do something. You very seldomly can solve a 0.65 with a, a via dog bones like this. There's not room. So a VN pad is the next solution. Um, so that is a form of uh, HDI, and typically you're going to plate the surface with a planar finish. The IPC has um, different types. So just I think you're familiar with these. This is one lamination cycle where I can do three different drill stages or maybe two, but it's one lamination. Here I have two lamination cycles where I do this, drill it, plate and, and etch, all that stuff. Then I add two layers. you got to add two because it's a balanced construction. And then I'm going to laminate them together. Okay, and then a secondary drill. Okay, you could actually drill here too. So, and then you could do it's a uh, multiple. I could do what's called a two n two. So two n two. That's how that definition goes. And some materials can go more than a four n four, but four n four hits the threshold of most of your standard materials. And if you don't know, if you see a, you're doing a board and it's got 4N4 and they want to go 5N4, you better upgrade your materials. Some of the tachyon and astras now can go much higher than that. I've heard them go up to 10 lamination cycles, but don't take my word for it. Always confirm it with your fabricator. Okay, a core board for space maybe. Um, let's see here. Um, then this type right here is the any layer vias. Um, you know I'm going to talk about Ormet at some point here, but that's a sintered paste. It's a copper paste, one lamination cycle. To do one of these, it's about 40 process steps for a fabricator, okay? And if you did these, that's 80. So you can see how this exponentially goes up. This is one lamination cycle. So you can save 120 by taking a 3N3 and just going with an any layer process. So your fabricators, when they can do this, and not all of them can, um, Ormet um, is, is the brand name that you can look up the Ormet University. Um, it's a great uh, process line, and, and fabricators care about their process line time. So I think I've covered most of this as far as doing, you know, this 0.65. You know, it's a must. You have to use some sort of uh, uh, microvia on this. The concept of sequential laminations, multiple stacking options. Again, they threaten the dielectric, uh, the D t sub d okay because you're stressing it and um again time and cost <clears throat> also going to thinner materials um you can literally truly have some very low vias because it's a one-to-one -one aspect ratio um so that's how you can do that uh see the 3d routing guess what it's way more time expensive and when you're calculating what time it takes for you to bid on a board if you know you've got a Z-axis type route, I mean, here's a cute little picture down here. Um, it takes you more time to do this than it takes you to drop one through via through. So you better just think about that. It's, it's, it's a factor. And so the way to learn a factor when you're in your profession is do something repeatedly and measure the time. And then how many times do I have to do it? A standard board could have, let's pick a number, 5,000 vias. If you had to do them with a Z-axis drill, um, that number is kind of like 15,000 now. So you got to think about that when you're calculating your routing time. Okay. Cause it takes longer to complete. Um, and if you bid something, it's hard for your sales and management to go back and ask for more time sometimes because we underestimated it. If they make scope changes, that's a different story. I can make the case. If you document what their changes did, it's an impact. Okay, but truly, because if I didn't bid it properly, so just know that if it's a Z-axis route, it's going to take you longer, probably. Um, so how do I know to build a stack up? So just try to go in and start trying to do it. It's kind of flawed. So I'm going to recommend the same way I did last week about doing a placement feasibility study, do a layout HDI feasibility. It's a pin escape feasibility. I get it that I'm going to have to do some very dense routing coming out of here, but I have a limited amount of layers. So if I wanted to consider this, okay, and I have an RF board where they, they don't, they like HDI. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to theorize this and I did it, you know, with a mock-up drawing here. You can do this on paper and what my layer usage would be. And can I break out on those layers? Can it be a ground plane and still break out? Okay, 
Um, and so you want to think this through. Now, just making ground connectivity to layer two is a little bit flawed because if I have a high speed signal coming from down here on the stack up, where's its return path energy? So ground vias a lot of times should be through vias. It's easier from a solvability standpoint to connect them to layer two, but from a signal integrity standpoint, if it's a high speed signal um, that's coming in on layer three, um, like here, um, this ground maybe should be a through via so that I, it tracks all the way down. So just give that some consideration. Okay. But doing this type of feasibility might tell me how many layers I will do in a, in this case, it became a three and three based on this. And I calculated I can do all my fan out to pin escape a via. Uh, that looks like a repeat. I think we're good. Um, I also went the wrong way. No, here we go. So ORMET sintering paste. I alluded to this earlier. Um, it's a Z. It's a paste that forms a Z interconnect. Okay. And it's uh, called a transient liquid phase sintering. Essentially, it uh, allows two adjacent layers um, to be joined. And just by a thermal thing, the paste turns into a solid metal. You're seeing a microsection of it there. And it uh, takes place uh, as a subcompositor and a composition lamination. Um, so it, you can use it with sequential buildup on a multi multi-layer core. But again, it just, the paste metallizes, forming the bond, filling it slightly. And because it's so thin, um, the Z-axis um, coefficient of thermal expansion is not as threatened. Okay, so it reduces the amount of lamination cycles. We covered these. Um, can resolve some via aspect ratios um, and annular ring concerns. Um, it eliminates back drilling. Okay, the back drilling as shown here is where I don't want to stub and therefore I back drill it. These are time consuming, error prone, contaminations can get in here, extra process to fill them or do whatever stuff. So it's much more elegant of a solution. Okay. Um, uh, it can improve some of the routability because guess what? I cannot route under a backdrop, but I can route here. If I use this type of via here, I can route two layers down underneath it. So you eliminate the full vias. I've actually run some test cases and it totally will outperform, outperform a through via uh, significantly. So here's the other usage for the um, format vias. If you guys have done some big load boards, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if you're used to doing LTX work or you know, any of those Agilent type testers or Qualcomm testers. Uh, we were doing some very high layer count boards at some point and <clears throat> I can't drill this. I mean, if I had four buried constructions, okay, via core constructions, okay, two lamination cycles, okay, I'd have four single lamination cycles and then one combined lamination cycles, or four singles and one. So it's really two lamination cycles. Um, so I'd have four 92 thick boards with an eight mil drill. That's acceptable, okay? But if my total board is that thick, I can't drill an eight mil drill in that size. It would give me a 48 to one aspect ratio. I can't plate that, okay? You know, maybe R and D can plate it with impulse plating and charge you twenty thousand bucks for a board. Um, I'm trying to make that sound ridiculous, but it's a whole lot easier using this. Where if I do this lamination, this lamination, this one, and this one singularly, and then I add the ormet paste between them, and then the second lamination cycle is joining them together. Okay, that's how that forms, like right there, and it solves the high aspect ratio. Uh, using the uh, combining of books. <clears throat> this just shows a little bit of the paste process that's that's done here. Um, there's a couple ways that it can be done. Um, typically, you know, our fabricators, again, is taking these metallized cores or they're going to etch the circuit. They can drill these and plate them, okay? And then they can uh, tack on the uh they tack on the prepreg right here and then they ormet paste these okay and they do that these four times and then they join the whole thing together in one lamination here so that's how they can do that there's a couple different methods that can be done in here 
And again, you'd never want to spring this on one of your fabricators. You want to confer with them early on. I think this is a good solvability uh, issue, Mr. Fabricator. And I also think that it electrically would perform better, but I want to run it by you from a fabrication standpoint. Are you familiar with this? Can you do it? Uh, do you have any concerns? Do you need some uh, forewarning that you may process, uh, run a few test cases through your line? Um, that's just doing what you should be doing always, and that's checking with your fabricator at the start of the layout cycle. Do not spring this on them at the end of the layout cycle. Okay. Um, so, again, this is a little bit of a showing the, the, a couple of different applications here. Again, the thick boards, I've kind of already covered this. Um, just for giant overall thick boards, reduces the aspect ratio. The other one a lot of times is used. Um, this is done when you guys do package design. A lot of your package design, you know, a BGA type uh, package uh, where they've got a flip chip on the board or something like that. Um, this becomes uh, a way to, instead of having a solder mask out there, just have a cap layer put on and the uh, ormet paste can be used um, taking what was the outer layer and adding a cap layer and using it here. Okay, so you can see that essentially you can use this when doing a, a high layer count board like in a package design and using a cap layer. So it can go one or two layers down depending on how you want to construct this. Okay, that is me trying to accelerate this and try to make our time frame. So with that, um, Scott, do you want Very to open the, the yeah. floor? Does anybody